Okay, so for our next uh, presentation, we have Tim Krieger from Bemidji State University, and he's a professor of geology, and he has one of his students here with him. And the title of their um, of their presentation is Application of High Altitude Ballooning Activity in a Course for Pre-Service Science Teachers. So Tim. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, just a little bit about our group here that uh, the course that we do, John and myself are the faculty members for this, and Cooper, Brianna, Alex, Heather, Michelle, Patrick, and Jed were the student body for this, uh, this class. Right? And uh, this uh, particular activity that we did this spring, uh, we actually managed to, we, we involved, uh, involved the middle school, Bemidji Middle School. The stuff hanging outside the payload box there is some of the middle school items. They wanted to see how big a marshmallow would get. Right? So they hung it outside, uh, outside the payload box where it could be viewed with the camera. And if you're looking down there, um, up in the upper right corner, that's uh, uh, upper and lower Red Lake. Right? And so that we actually did this activity and uh, launched from just about uh, 30 miles to the uh, west of here, or east of here. Um, our Activity, our high altitude ballooning at Bemidji State, we started our program in 2011, right? And for the entirety of our program, that we've had a collaboration with uh, the professional education program here. Uh, we've also have had a persistent collaboration with our physics program and, um, of course, the geology program where I work. Right? In addition, that we have had a continuous collaboration with Central Lakes College of the Physics and Earth Science programs at Central Lakes down in Brainerd. A uh, guy in the blue there with the thumbs up, that's Dave Kabelka. He's the Earth Science instructor down there at Central Lakes. Right? And uh, that adds another dimension to our work, right? because we do have the opportunity to work with, with the two-year college students also. Right? And then we have had a persistent, for the last two years, uh, we've been using uh, working with the Bemidji Middle School also. Uh, the course in which we've been applying this program right, is called Integrative Science for Teachers. Right? And it was kind of a, it's almost a kind of a garbage can course where when the Minnesota, state of Minnesota redesigned their um, teaching standards or teacher education standards back in the early 2000s, that they had very, very specific standards that every teacher of science would know. Most of these we were able to sign in the disciplines, right? But there were a few of these, uh, few of these standards that we actually felt we better design a course specifically to address those, right? Because of the fact that they were interdisciplinary, right? And um, so we established this course back in 2001 that um, it is a required course for all professional education students, whether they're seeking a secondary education licensure or whether they're actually seeking to teach science in the middle school level. Right? Uh, we have team taught it between geology and physics since its inception in 2001. Right? And it really does relate to understanding interconnectedness uh, between the science disciplines. And if you do have uh, any uh, interest in what these standards look like, they are available online through the, uh, the uh, Minnesota State Revisor. Our primary learning objectives, um, essentially understanding and developing concepts of science inquiry, right? And that's where obviously the high altitude ballooning has a real strong uh, strength there. Uh, evaluating data, both in a qualitative sense and a quantitative sense. Uh, identify sources of error and evaluate your data to see if they're valid. Uh, understanding connections between domains of science and including aspects of technology. Right? And then communicating experimental results. So we make a very strong effort to make sure that these primary learning objectives are um, obtained during the course. Uh, when we first started this course back in the 2000s, we actually would ask the students to work with another STEM discipline faculty member to actually design a research project and bring it to completion. And then they would bring it back to the group, back to our class, and they would report on it. Right? And that led to a huge amount of problems simply because of the fact that 
we were trying to engage other faculty from the science disciplines, but they had to do it on their own time. Right? And so that did lead to a huge problem. And so we were, I was actually real happy when we were able to bring this high altitude ballooning in it because we can still engage other disciplines, and we do, right? but we largely could keep most of the project within our class so that we didn't have to depend upon additional faculty in order to be able to, to uh, complete this, uh, complete these learning objectives. Uh, what we did this spring, uh, we, we have brought, we did bring the course into the, into this, uh, the high altitude ballooning into this course in 2012. Uh, we were just getting started in the high altitude program at that time, and our first year was really kind of a big shakedown to help us develop a more efficient and effective high altitude ballooning program. We did basic sensing, uh, but a lot of it was basically making sure that we had the fundamentals down, and it really gave us, as a group, a lot of confidence that we were able to repeat this um, type of activity again. Uh, we did seek funding to improve the activity design in this class. We got some through the Taylor program, which Don ran, and we also gave, um, got quite a bit of money, actually, from Bemidji State through internal funding, um, actually for working on uh, curriculum design. Uh, we modified extensively the, the design of the program based upon the feedback from the 2013 students. Right? Uh, we did add a significant amount of time. That This is the probably major single class activity that we do. Uh, we had discrete steps. So in, rather than say, here's your project, tell us what it was like when you were done, that we set up discrete steps so that students would report after each step, right? And of course, the goal there is to try to make sure that they stay on the project and don't end up trying to do everything during the last two days. And that actually, I think, had what was uh, pretty effective um, to keep them moving on the programs. And then we offered several opportunities during the development stage to actually have the students give experimental design critique and actually work with one another to critique each other's experimental, um, experimental ideas. So our activity this year, we had uh, seven students in their program. Uh, the students each were, were worked in groups of two, um, two or one, right? And they each had to design an experiment that would utilize some of our data. Right. And so we had several of the students who were actually already taking the microbiology course, and Michelle was one of those, that she, uh, they actually designed an experiment to evaluate survivability of yeast and bacteria that were sent up um, under different conditions within the balloon itself. Uh, we also had a comparison of ultraviolet intensities, and they were interested in comparing intensities at altitude versus what we would see for normal environmental exposures of ultraviolet light. Uh, we had one student group that developed an Arduino microprocessor set up so that they would be able to um, collect ultraviolet and altitude data, and they wanted to operate a servo, um, use a servo operated sampling port there. And then we had one student that wanted to sample atmospheric particles. Right. And uh, we also, Central Lakes College and the Bemidji Middle Schools also did contribute payload components to this, this particular launch. Our launch was on March 20th. Uh, we do have an advantage up in this part of the state when we launch when it's still ice in the lakes because it takes away the water risk. Right. However, you better carry snowshoes and or cross-country skis. But uh, we went up to Red Lake Falls here. It's just about 40 or 50 miles w uh, east of uh, Grand Forks here. And then we came down in a, um, in a plowed field um, just north of Faustin. Our flight attained about 98,000 feet. And uh, so we were very successful in the actual launch. Found out that kids are really good at hearing things. We had a siren on the, on the payload and the kids they could hear that thing a mile away, right? Whereas, forget it, I couldn't hear it. <laughs> so, it's pretty funny. Okay, I, I just kind of wanted to um, 
spend a little bit of time thinking about what we thought what we recognized as the challenges for the course. Right? And I'm going to talk about it a little bit from a faculty perspective. Then I'm going to ask Michelle to talk about it a little bit from a student perspective. Right? That as a curriculum designer and presenter that that we see things a little bit differently. Um, obviously, we have to design the objectives, and so we see things a little bit differently from the student perspective. But the amount of time that was taken for this particular activity was very significant. Right? We devote over 30% of the course to the activity. Right? In addition, we had the full day for the launch activity. Right? And then there was actually a full day, but it was not a standard class day that was actually divine, um, devoted to the presentation material. Right. Um, so we had to actually take and redesign our whole syllabus in order to be able to fit that much time into one activity. And so many of the other, um, many of the other learning objectives, and we do teach a very significant amount of physics and earth science within this particular course, that some of that had to be uh, essentially condensed a little bit. Uh, I thought, thought it was actually kind of difficult after the launch to maintain student engagement. Right, that they were pretty well strongly engaged in the preparation phase. It was almost anticlimactic after the launch was completed. Right, they had the data to analyze and start thinking about how they wanted to present their data. And I thought it was actually really challenging to keep them engaged at that point. Uh, because of the lack of time, we didn't have any opportunity to do any forensic analysis. Uh, not everything worked the way you wanted it to. Right? And so we really didn't have enough time to do that. Uh, I think that's really one of the most, you think about an engineering, engineering design, I think that is one of the most important components. And so I think we're going to try to uh, see how we might be able to redesign this um, so that we actually do have a little bit more time for that. Right. And our, we did our launch on, on the spring equinox, which is just after our spring break. Right. And that taking a week off or 10 days off just before you have a major project, not a good idea. Um, but, right, a student's, our campus presentation day was on April 9th, right, and so we really couldn't put it off any longer if the students were going to report on these results, right. So, uh, we thought that was a, I, I'm not sure as long as we keep this course in the spring semester whether we're going to be able to get around that, that um, challenge. So, what I would like to do now, I'd like to introduce Michelle, and uh, Michelle was one of the students in the class. And she is, she was in the class because you're going to be teaching, you, you want the middle school licensure, right? So sure, her intention is going to be to middle school, um, middle school teacher. And I asked her to just think about from a student's perspective what they thought the strengths and the weaknesses were. So Michelle, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, can you push the button? Oh, yeah. Okay, so first of all, I kind of want to talk about all the class requirements that we he kind of already went over, but... So we did, I think about two-thirds of the class was uh, focused on earth science and physics, and we covered topics of climate change, the age of the earth, and fossil identification. And we also did lots of physics labs that were both computer-based and hands-on. And then the last third of the class was high-altitude ballooning activities. And with that, we were required to design the project and the payloads. Um, do the launch and the recovery, and work with the middle school stu students and collect the data and do flight, predi flight predictions and um, test the communications for the um, tracking of the balloon. Um, so I think that myself and the other students that were in this course thought that some of the pros were how it connects and fine tunes a lot of the science topics. Um, this one project can integrate almost any kind of science. So for the scientific experiments, we, the pros of that were how you had to collaboratively work with a partner. And for example, my partner was better at microbiology than I was. So he actually taught me more about the microbiology aspect of the project. And I was able to help him more with how maybe students would see it. So we could pick partners that were able to balance each other out. And then the project is also very authentic and it's higher level thinking. You're integrating and you 
touch on a lot of different topics and things like that. And it also allows you to work with the students a little bit, so you can actually get the experience with the middle school students. Um, another, some more of the pros were the launch and recovery itself. I had no previous experience to the HAB project. I'd heard about them, but I've never actually done them before. So it was actually really, really fun to see the process of setting up the balloons and actually going and tracking it. My favorite part was the tracking because it was just, it's, I felt like a storm chaser almost because you're just driving in a car and you're like, oh, I can see it on this website and where is it? So that was really fun. And it was also really fun to see the kids and how exciting they got. They actually got so excited that they stopped on the side of the road about half a mile too far because they were too excited and they all got out of the bus before they actually realized that's not where the balloon was. <laughs> so it was really fun to see how engaging the students got. And you can see in the picture, all of them are holding the payloads and they all ran right out there to see if their, their little man was still out there and if the marshmallow had exploded and different things like that. So just the uh, motivation and the excitement, I think, is what really gets the students. And that's one of the main reasons I think that this would be a very good lesson to teach in the classroom. I would definitely want to do that in my class. And then, you actually, so you get to see firsthand how the transmissions work, and you have to go and interpret the data. When we got back and we had to um, look at all the data, it was on a, a grid, and it just looked like numbers to me. And so that was actually a very good learning point for me, because I, we had to go and actually interpret the data. And it was such a great learning experience for myself and other people on, in the class. Um, and another pro, I thought, and several other students, was that we did get to present at the um, Student Achievement Con Conference. Um, so it was a day dedicated to presenting what we had done, uh, the, experience that, the experiments that we did, and tell other people about them, and get other people to know about uh, the project from in the same university. Um, and cons, the biggest one, of course, is time. You felt like you were always rushed. And as you saw earlier, that we had to meet Earth and space standards as well as physics. So it's really hard to try and jam all that into one course, but we did it. Um, and sometimes the communication between your group and the different groups in the class and just within your own group was a little challenging because you have contradicting schedules. So there's lots of times where you can't meet up with your partner and things like that. Um, and then after the launch and recovery, there was a really short period of time where we could uh, go over the data and put together our presentations for the achievement conference. And another con was the um, launch had to be a weather appropriate. And living in northern Minnesota, you know that last winter we were practically buried in snow. So there was a postponed date. So that always interferes with your class schedules and other things like that. Because it was a full day that was dedicated for that launch and recovery. So that was a big con for some people. And another con is the HAB terminology. The it can have a terminology of its own. So some of the people who weren't familiar with it didn't really know sometimes what they were talking about. So, so some of the recommended changes that from the uh, surveys that were took from the students at the end was to clearly define the have terminology at the beginning of the course and maybe spend more time doing that and really getting to know this, what it is that we're doing. And then more in-class time to work on projects, of course, and work more with the middle school students. I would really, really like to see that aspect more so. I think it would be really good if we could get a practicum into that class so we could actually go into the classroom with the middle school students and maybe have them work with them on a project. 
I think that would be really beneficial because then they're learning at the same time as we are, just kind of differently. So, and then more GPS tracking systems. I think it would be great if we could have the tracking systems on every vehicle that we take out when we're trying to track the balloon because we only had two of them, I believe. One on the bus. Was there one on the bus? No, they had iPads. Oh, yep. They used their iPads so they could track it on the bus. But there was just one main tracking system in uh, Tim's vehicle. And so it would have been fun if we could have had one on the van we took, too, so that we could have maybe had a challenge to see who could find the balloon first. But and that's all I have for you. Is there any questions or anything? Okay, just advance one more. Oh. I just wanted to make sure that we made an acknowledgments here that our, our uh, high altitude balloon activities have largely been funded through the Minnesota Space Camp Consortium. Right, the uh, curriculum development funds were obtained through the Taylor University funds and through Bemidji State, and all of our equipment purchases have been funded through our Center for Environmental Economic Earth and Space Studies at Bemidji State. So, questions? What week did you fly? I, I think, think it was a it, Thursday. It was a Thursday, yeah. I ask only because when I'm doing a class that involves ballooning, I'll never fly in a weekday because students are supposed to be in class. I always tell them they have to give me a Saturday. And maybe that goes over well, and maybe that doesn't go over so well, but this interference with class schedules surprised me. I thought you were going to be flying in a non-school day. We've tried that, and we have such a high percent of our, percentage of our students that work outside of class, and the weekends are their primary work days. And so we've been asked not to by the students because of the fact that it costs them money miss a day of work, which is too bad, really. Other questions? Yeah. I'm interested in your, uh, you talked about one of your pros was authenticity. Mm -hmm. how, how authentic is uh, the survivability of yeast and uh, bacteria? How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you rate how authentic that was? I mean, I'm just curious from us. Uh, physics perspective. Uh, the reason I'm asking you that question is because I, I like to, I would love to give my students, biology students, some authentic stuff. You know, we just told them, uh, the authentic stuff we give them is a spherical cow. That's, that's a joke we say in physics, but that's not authentic enough. So how authentic is that? It was actually, after all said and done, there was lots of variables that maybe weren't considered in the planning process. So it's kind of hard to say if it's 100% authentic because there's so many different things that could go wrong and you have to really think about all the different things. And it was more, you could see that more after it was over, but we did have the uh, one that, we had se several plates that stayed down on Earth and we kept them in a refrigerator. And then we sent up, uh, different plates that were covered for protection of UV, and then some that were just completely outside, and then we kept some that were inside, and we measured the different, um, the pressure, the temperature, the UV exposure, and all those different things, and we wanted to see if those exposures to the extreme upper atmosphere would change the growth rate of the, the yeast and E. coli that were compared to on Earth. And it was very challenging when we got back because then you had to, you would expose it again to UV as soon as you took it out of the plates. And it was, it's very challenging to find like the, a real authentic one like that. But with different projects like the server motor and different things like that, those are, have less variables in them. So it's, it's always a give and take. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. <laughs> In one of your cons, you mentioned the um, maybe the lack of understanding the HAB terminology. In what ways was that a problem? That wasn't so much a problem for me as it was for some of the other students in the class. So 
I didn't really get the chance to talk with the person who had made that comment, so I'm not sure what exactly his um, terms that he didn't understand were, but it would probably be the different sensors that we used and um, the, I guess I'm not 100% sure what his terminology issues were, but like payload, I don't think they knew what that was or how they filled the balloon with helium and different things like that. If we had more classmates here, <laughs> it would have been easier to answer those. Uh, if you were to fly again, what kind of experiments would you suggest for a similar class or for groups trying to get other... I'm an engineering student, I'd like to get science students in because I run out of like, ideas for science-style experiments. What, what kind of things would you suggest flying to get people interested? Well. One of the things that I really liked about the day that we were actually out there doing the launch was seeing the different experiments that the, um, what was it, Itasca College? Central Lakes. Central Lakes College had. And they had really good ones I liked with the sunscreen, where they put sunscreen on different um, uh, beads that change color when they're exposed to light. And so they actually put those on the outside and uh, they had their camera pointed to it so that they could <coughs> see how effective the sunscreen worked and they had different kinds of sunscreen and different things like that. And they also had one that was attached on the outside that had a balloon and it acted as a lung. So it um, expanded as when due to the lack of pressure and then the liquid drained into the other tube. So they wanted to measure how much liquid uh, went from the one tube to the next. The only problem with, with that was, it's on the way down, that there's so much turbulence and violence is that it broke off. Oh, no. But they did have the camera pointed to it, so they still could see, They through the video, that's what they really relied on for that kind of thing. So it's hard to really say what projects to put on because you do have to think about, well, is it going to stay on the payload? Should it be in or out? Or, but like servo motors and things like that, I think if you could really fine tune that and really get that going well, that that would be a really good thing because uh, what with the servo motor that they tried to do was <coughs> at a certain altitude was to open and close it so they could get a sample of the upper atmosphere. And so if you could actually really get that to work, there was some difficulties with that, but that would be cool, I think. So. Let's take one more question. Were you involved with the middle schools? I mean, as a pre-service teacher, you were doing your own experiment, but were you also mentoring these middle school students? Um, well, we weren't so as much mentoring them as we were just explaining what we were doing to them, or do, doing with them. So we explained our experiments to them, and they had their own experiments that they had worked with their teacher to do. And so that's like the biggest change that I would want is to actually be more involved with them and work more with them so that we could work together and maybe do a project that way. I, I should, this course was actually designed largely as a content course, right? and so we have never really included any time in the syllabus for actually practica, where they would be going out and actually working with the school. That might be a possibility of trying to combine it with another course too, that is actually focusing on that to bring this kind of activity in more than one course.